Hello, everyone, and welcome to In-House Counsel Insights, where we bring in in-house counsel attorneys to share their experiences across different industries and share with us tricks of the trade and other things of the like. On today's show, I have Mario Castillo. He is the Chief Operating Officer and General Counsel with Lone Star College. Welcome, Mario. Hi, Chris. Thanks for having me. You're very welcome. So first of all, let's talk about Lone Star a little bit. Um, it's one of the top three college systems in the country, right? Top t as far as the number of um, enrollees. Yep, it's it's quite the operation. I think when a lot of people think of Lone Star, especially people that are local, they don't really sort of understand the scope and size of this thing. So it is, you know, we have on average about 100,000 students, uh, about 7,500 employees, um, eight, 7.6 million square feet of property that covers about 1500 square miles uh, about 30 locations 22 to 30 depending on sort of how you count locations and so it's a really sizable operation overall between our bond dollars and our budget you're talking about a billion dollar operation wow wow and you know in addition to being one of the leaders of lone star you have a really interesting background so your parents were from mexico right correct I'm a first generation American. I'm actually a first generation pretty much everything that I've done. Um, my mother didn't even go to high school. So when I graduated from high school, I was a first generation high school graduate on my mother's side. Neither of my parents went to college. Um, I went to college and then I also went to graduate school, obviously, to become a lawyer. Um, and I have 12 aunts and uncles on one side and eight on the other. So I've got about 100 cousins. And as far as I know, I was the very first person uh, to graduate from college at all and definitely wow. a four-year degree and i can tell you one of the things that i'm really proud of is after me there's dozens and dozens wow and so that's amazing person so i'm really proud of that thanks and and what what drove you to to do education um you know for me my my parents um and i think this is something that's lost in a lot of people i think there's a there's a difference between being educated and being smart Mm. Right? So I have two very, very smart parents, uneducated, but very, very smart, very, very bright. And so my father from very early on said, you know, I don't, I don't want you out here with me working at a factory. Uh, most of my uncles do construction. And so on the weekends, my dad would arrange for my uncles to pick me up and take me with them. Um, and looking back now, they probably did a, they took it a little bit harder on me, but I did concrete. Right. So I got burned by pouring concrete. I did frames. I did drywall mm -hmm. roofs, the whole not, like pretty much anything that has to do with building houses I've done. Uh, and I remember like everything from, you know, dying of thirst to carrying, you know, I was a young man and I could carry one plank, but they could carry four or five. And I remember them being really hard on me and then afterward being like, we don't want you out here with us. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. so between sort of it really one of the things I'm really proud about. Uh, my family and my culture is it really was a family effort um, from my aunts and uncles and everybody to sort of pitch in and say, okay, here's kind of the first horse that we have that really can sort of run that distance. Let's all sort of pour into that person. And I, I'm telling you, every from construction workers to people that clean houses, to people that clean hotel rooms, to people that mow lawns, um, you know, those are my relatives. And every one of them uh, played a part in my success and i'm really proud of that and so um everyone played a part everyone kind of kept me motivated and really you know when you have that many people around you motivating you it's, it's really sort of it's, it's easier than when you're sort of really doing it by myself by yourself so i may have been the first but i most definitely am not self-made and i didn't do it by myself i had a lot of help along the way i love that i just watched the arnold documentary and he said something very similar that that he wouldn't have accomplished what he accomplished, but for the people around him that supported him. And, and I'm sure your family's super proud. So so why lawyer? Did, did you watch some lawyer show as a kid? You know, no, we, we really didn't have a TV uh, when I was growing up. And, and really, I remember the first TV that we got uh, from, from about April until October, there was only one thing that was on that TV when I was around and it was baseball. My dad was a huge baseball fan. Um, and so I grew to actually hate baseball because whenever I wanted to watch the TV, all we had was to watch was baseball. So no, I, I didn't learn it from TV. You know, growing up in, in, in our neighborhood and in my community, there was three sort of 
positions that were revered and are still revered, and that is professors, teachers are revered, um, uh, teachers, medical doctors, and lawyers. And so those three things, to become one of those three things was basically seen as some sort of almost like celestial impossible dream. You know, my father always says, if you're going to do something, you try to do it the very best. You know, one of the things that I told students a week ago at Upward Bound was, you know, my father used to say, if someone gives you a broom to sweep a room, you show them how a room is to be swept, son. Mm. So that, that sort of, when you carry that sort of immigrant blue collar mentality into a world like law, where you have a lot of people that are very entitled, a lot of people that don't know what it's like to work outside in the heat. Yep, absolutely. And so when you, when you bring a mindset of, and, and I'll give you an example. So one of the things that I've done over the last year and a half, two years that I trained for Ironman. And so one of the things that I had to do, is I had to go to the pool every morning before work. And so I'd be there at four or five o'clock in the morning in the locker room changing. There was a man, an older gentleman that walked up to me and said, oh man, where do you work? Um, and I said, Lone Star College. And he goes, where, do you have to wear a suit every day? And I said, no, sir, I get to wear a suit every day. <laughs> right? and, and even that, like the mentality of, I know what it's like to work construction. I know what it's like to clean hotel rooms. I know what it's like to clean people's houses, to mow lawns. The idea that I get to wear a crisp Italian suit with a white shirt and a nice tie, it's a dream come true. And where a lot of people sort of see a burden, I see gratitude. And so really like that's really sort of the mindset is if you're going to do something, let's do it with excellence. Be grateful for the things that you have. And, and those two things, especially in law, where you have so many people that take their blessings for granted, I mean, you'll start distinguishing yourself. And I think that's part of what's helped me get to where I am today is sort of having a very sort of immigrant blue collar mentality. I always joke with people that the collar may be white, but it was built with blue collar sweat. <laughs> I like that. So how did you get into Lone Star? So I worked at a law firm and uh, at a law firm called Monty Ramirez LLP and gave me a great opportunity right when I uh, left my clerkship working for the federal judge. Gave me a lot of sort of freedom very early on for as many years as I had to do a lot of very interesting work. And I'm, I'm really grateful to Jacob Monty and, and Danny Ramirez for the trust that they put in me uh, to do a lot of sort of work really early on. And so, um, one of the things was, you know, as a political subdivision, Lone Star has insurance. And as an, as you know, as a lawyer, billing rates are a big deal. And so um, mm -hmm. Lone Star didn't pay and still doesn't pay the highest billing rates essentially um, at a law firm. And so a lot of that work usually goes to junior partners. And so that's what happened to me. I'd be, I, I was the junior partner and I ended up doing a lot of the Lone Star work, which was a really big client once again for Jacob and Danny. It was their client well before sort of I came to work here. And I just did a lot of sort of work for them over two or three years. Uh, Chancellor Head at the time he was President Head. When President Head became Chancellor Head, um, there was a vacancy for the general counsel position and I applied and the rest, as I say, is history. Okay. And you're, you, you apply as general counsel, but you're chief operating officer, general counsel. I understand you've also had some other roles, maybe nearly every administrative role and then that company, every corporate role. Um, so what, what has the, the interrelationship been between general counsel, chief operating officer, and the other things that you've done? Right. So a lot in higher ed, it's really common actually to have sort of a, what I call a corporate title as a placeholder to place the general counsel. So you'll see a lot of vice president and general counsel, uh, vice chancellor and general counsel, the vice chancellorship is really to signal to everyone else internally kind of the rank of that person. Mm -hmm. I, think, I think in many ways of my um, titles is that the COO office is a whole distinct division with its own staff. So really I am literally the COO. So right now I'm in my COO's office, right? I have another office that's the general counsel's office. And so it has two different staffs. Um, and so I basically run back and forth all day long. And so as COO, I oversee everything other than really the colleges themselves, which are the prerogatives of presidents, computers, and money. You've really been a president too, right? I'm sorry? You've been a president too, haven't you? Yeah. So uh, right now I'm the acting president of North Harris temporarily, and I've been that for a month. And then about, let's see, two years ago, you know, those COVID years, they kind of meld together. I, I want to say it was 20. Now. 
I want to say it was 20, 2020 to 2021 during sort of the height of COVID, if you will, I was president of Lone Star College Kingwood. And, and you know, talking about first, like we talked about a little bit earlier, uh, one of the things that, you know, I'm so focused on sort of trying to do the best that I can, the job that I can, that I, I don't really have time to sit down and identify with sort of the first. But someone walked up to me after I became the first the president at Kingwood and told me that I was the first Latino president interim acting or otherwise of one of the campuses here love it and so i was the first temporary president of kingwood and then i'm very proud that dr melissa gonzalez took over for me and she's now the permanent or the she's ongoing. great president. too and she she's latina and she's the first latina and so i'm very proud of that as well and um she's doing a great job out there and so uh you know i think it's easier uh, when we're giving these opportunities and we do a good job for other people to be giving opportunities as well. So let's talk challenges. So over your years at Lone Star, what, what has your biggest challenge been or maybe one or two challenges? Because I know you just mentioned COVID too. That has to be a challenge. So I think as a lawyer, one of the really growing pains really early on was getting operational hats and sort of starting to think about things. You know, as lawyers, we think of sort of the pie as being all law. Right. But really, when you become an operational officer, the legal part of it is really just a sliver of the calculation. Mm -hmm. Like There was times when, I, for example, when I was at Kingwood, where I would come back here to the general counsel's office and be like, boss, when you were general counsel, you would have completely advised about what you did as president. I'm like, correct, because as president, here are my concerns. I'm worried about enrollments. I'm worried about community. I'm worried about mm -hmm. all these other things. I, I can't just be worried about a black letter reading of the law. And right. so that's really sort of one of the biggest growing pains and one of the things that I'm really thankful for, having been given several opportunities here by Dr. Head over the years. Like you said, I've been vice chancellor, COO, I'm the police commissioner, so I oversee all of our safety and security. Hurricane Harvey was a big one. Um, Hurricane Harvey, the pandemic was another one. And, you know, we actually, as I was mentioning earlier, we had a hurricane during the pandemic. Mm. Um, and so that was really interesting because, you know, all of our all of our processes for example, hurricane response, assume that there's no pandemic, right? And so even, for example, walking the buildings, we had to make sure that, you know, it was one officer basically walking the buildings by themselves, because if we had two officers in the building and one of them tested positive, then we had to quarantine both of them, right? And so there was a lot of logistical things like that that were really challenging, but really between the pandemic and Hurricane Harvey and having floods and weather events during the pandemic, um, I hope that that will be the most difficult part of working at Lone Star for some time. <laughs> I've heard that the last five or six years have been rough, so I'm hoping that the much more longer time people are correct and we kind of get a break for a few years. So I'm going to end with this, and I'm going to do a plug for you. You did not ask me to do this, but you're, you're in the running for chancellor right now, right? Yes, sir. And, and that's amazing. And so tell us, if you if you did get chancellor, what would be the first? What would be the first thing that I would do? What would be the first as chancellor, the first Latino again, the, yeah, the youngest? So I would be the first person of color. I would be okay. the first person of color, um, which is a responsibility that I would take incredibly serious. Because again, I think one of the things, one of the burdens as people of color that we carry is when you're given a shot, if you screw it up, you're not just screwing it up for yourself. Mm -hmm. right? There's a lot of people that will say, and this is why we shouldn't have given it to someone that young. So I'll be the youngest, for example, I just turned 40, right? So I'll be by far the youngest. That's why we shouldn't give it to someone that young. I'll be the first person of color. That's why we shouldn't give it to someone who's a person of color, right? And so when you do things and you achieve things, when you're the first, it comes with a special burden and or responsibility, depending on how you look at it. And so, yeah, I'm excited about it. You know, I think there's about eight or nine. I'm not really sure. I'm on the semifinalist, I think, is what they're calling it. Um, you know, we're going to go through the process. And like I tell everybody, um, I don't know if I'm going to become the chancellor or not, but there's one one way for sure that you will not get a job, and that is if you don't apply. And so I always tell people, you know, you might not get it, but at least let someone else decide that you're not qualified or that the job is not for you. Don't ever self-select out. So I'm following my own advice here. Well, if I had a vote, I would certainly vote for you. And thanks for being on the show, Mario. I really appreciate it. Well, thank you for having me.